talking about 2D particle equilibrium and we showed all these learning objectives. Well, I want to do one more thing on 2D particle equilibrium and that's this problem which is up on canvas under the supplementary problems and we have this collar A and this collar A it can slide up and down on this frictionless vertical rod and, and so I'm not I don't expect you to write much down from this I want us to think about this actually a little bit more conceptually and, and just kind of let's just watch and try to see if we can go through the process for picking our FBDs and use it for this problem now and it's attached to this spring right here right in the spring it goes we have this cable it goes over this pulley at B and then it comes over here and then this they have a spring right there so the constant of the spring is four pounds per inch so they tell us that and the spring is unstretched when h is equal to 12 inches so here's h so it's when h is equal to 12 inches it's unstretched I want to point out too along the base down here they have the horizontal distance between the a and c right that's 12 inches and that's fixed right so this 12 inches down here is fixed then they tell us this green part knowing that the system is equilibrium when h is equal to 16. so now they're saying okay you know what this is equal to 16. remember when it was equal to 12 then it was unstretched and so what does that do when we make h equal to 16 doesn't that make the distance the length from a to b is going to change isn't it and as that length from a to b changes then aren't we stretching the spring and that would be the stretch in our spring and so they ask us they say they say when it's if it's equally around when h is 16 inches determine the weight of the collar okay so now what i want us to do and i'm going to do this as a poll here again and i want to know which fbd should we pick and think about this uh, we're not going to work in groups i was thinking about sending you to breakout rooms but i decided against that so pick the right now just pick the fbd remember we i talked about identifying our options should we do a should we do b should we do c and our ultimate goal for fbds right was to pick an fbd that had knowns so we need knowns and not too many unknowns so which fbd should we do should we do a should we do b should we do c for this one so i've got 37 percent have have voted here um and so you know don't be afraid to just go through this and say okay you know what if i did an fbd at b wouldn't i have a force going down this way and I'd have a force going this way. And actually, wouldn't those two be exactly the same because it's a, a frictionless pulley? So if I call that F1, then this one would also be F1. And then I, I would have some force that's supporting those two, the support force right there at point B. So, so actually, do we have any, um, you know, maybe we do have known values. One thing about B is does it include what we're trying to find? What are we trying to find we're trying to find the weight of the collar right we're trying to or let's see um determine the weight of the collar yeah so w a we want to find that w a it doesn't necessarily include that w a does it okay now what about it i see other people some people are picking c if i did an fbd at c wouldn't it just be a force going straight up and that would be f1 too right because isn't that the same force and then this i'd have an f at the support right there going support at the floor call it a different thing right going straight down now so it looks like on on those two right there actually that's not really going to get us anything the fbd at a is what what we're going to use we're going to have an f1 we're going to have wa which is what we're looking for and if we think about this in terms of equilibrium as I've drawn it now with those two forces, an F1 and a WA, I can't meet equilibrium in the X direction. So actually we're gonna have a normal force on here as well. Now we really haven't talked too much about normal forces. This frictionless vertical rod is kind of a key into that right there, into that normal force. And so I'm using this problem more to get us to see how we need a process to pick these FBDs, right? And because 
the problem can just, we change the picture. And that's one of the most difficult things in statics is we change the picture. And the process is really the same though. It's like we need to draw an FBD and then we can start solving that, um, we can start solving that problem. So I'm gonna go ahead and end polling there. I'll show you um, the most popular choice was B, but the correct answer is, is A in that one. And this whole solution is up on Canvas. So I'm not gonna go through the whole solution, but you can see they basically figure out the force in the spring is what they do from geometry because we know the change in distance along the from the pulley to this point to the block A there is basically they can find the stretch length and they can find the unstretched length. They can find the force in the spring. And then we only have two unknowns in our FBD and we can solve for those two unknowns there. Okay, I see. Um, yes, if you're, William, if you're having trouble with your Wi-Fi, there will be um, a, um, a recording on Canvas. I'm, I am recording. If I ever forget to record, um, if you notice that, make sure and remind me. Okay, and so this, you can find this problem if you go to the supplementary example problems up on Canvas, and then you go down to particle equilibrium and 2D class examples, you'll see this class example that we just went over. Okay, so if you want notes from that or anything, I really wanted us to think about and just see how, you know, this process is going to work. Um, it's not so important and, you know, you do have to think about it in your homework for 2D particle equilibrium. But as we move through the semester, that FBD process is just going to become more and more important. Okay, any questions before I, I move on there? Any questions that anybody wants to ask right now? How did they solve for LAB? So, they, how do they solve for LAB? Yeah, twelve root two. So basically, they just made two right triangles. So if you look at this up here. Um, it, when it's unstretched, they, we basically have a right triangle that's 12 and 12. And so you can find the unstretched length of that hypotenuse, which is the distance from B to A. And then the stretched length is when this is now 16 over here, and this is still 12. So this is 16 and this is 12. And then they can find that hypotenuse there. And so the difference between those, those lengths between A and B, between the unstretched and the stretch case, that's how you find the stretch in the spring. Good question. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Or whoever that was. Basil. Okay. All right. Let's talk about three-dimensional particle equilibrium now. So moving back into 3D, stepped away from 3D for one day last time. Our learning objectives, exactly the same as they were for 2D. It's just for 3D now. So our equilibrium equations for three dimensions, this just means we have summing the forces in the X, the Y, and the Z now. And so we have three equations of equilibrium, which means we can solve problems with three unknowns. But our drawing the FBDs is going to be super key. And then using those equilibrium equations to solve for the unknown forces this is really the easy part, right? Once we get the FBD correct, you, implementing the equations is just, you know, looking at the picture and summing forces in the X, Y, and Z. And then this one, we can also have the same as we had in 2D, solve for an unknown mass or weight, giving them a maximum allowable force in a cable. And actually our example problem we'll do today will be with that maximum allowable thing. Our homework problems on this, we only have two homework problems for 3D particle equilibrium. This is due on Sunday, and you're asked to find F1, F2, and F3. Notice you're given some planar projections. So we're back into the vector stuff that we talked about. So that vector is gonna make, using those vectors is gonna make our life really easy. Also notice there's asking us for three unknowns. Well, how many equations do we have? We have three equations of equilibrium, so we can solve for all three of those unknowns. Our second homework problem is determine the maximum mass of the crate so that the tension developed in any cable does not exceed some set value there. 
And so in this one, we're given a bunch of coordinates, but again, we need to take those coordinates and get it into our vectors is really one of our first steps in these problems here. So this is our lecture example, very similar to that last homework problem that I just showed you all. And let's write out our, our given information. And when we're doing things in 3D, to make our lives easier, what I like to do for the given information is instead of writing all these dimensions here, um, I'm gonna just show the you know point A, B, C, and D in the general location of where they occur. And then I'm gonna use coordinates. So instead of dimensions and dimension lines, I'm just gonna use coordinates. So our given information, let's start with our, let's see, we've got the Y axis is going off to the right. And right, remember, we always wanna pay attention to where those axes are going, what the orientation of our right-handed coordinate system is. And the X axis is coming out of the page and then the Z axis is going straight up. And our rope here then, let's see, we've got a segment of rope that kind of comes up Oh, maybe it goes to about right there. And let's just call that, that's point B. I've got another segment of rope that goes to about, oh, I guess I could pull it back just maybe a little bit. Maybe I don't want to do it quite that long. We have another segment that goes like right there. We just call that point C. And then we have a segment that goes along the x-axis. We're just going to call that point D. And then we have our crate that's hanging down here. And what we are trying to find is this, um, this W of that crate right there. And then we have point A right here. So now we haven't completed our given information, but what I'm gonna do is next to each of these points, I'm just gonna label the coordinates and then that's gonna give us all the information that we need. I'll do the easy one. A is zero, zero, zero. Now I'm gonna call on somebody else to do the harder ones. Like what is the X coordinate of B, Ivan? Chavez, what's the X coordinate of B? Okay, Ivan is not here. Um, um, Isla, Isla Kerrigan. Sorry if I butchered that. Is Isla not here either? No. Okay. Well, maybe she changed her name. Um, so C to D decided not to show up today. Basil, I know you're here. Basil, what's the X coordinate of B? Negative two. Negative two. Okay. Now, one of the th nice things, and, you know, I'd spent a lot of time, I understand, like calling names and stuff like that. But I want to emphasize here that. One of the nice things about doing this is you can just focus on one thing at a time, right? You look, there's the x-axis. You say, okay, what dimension is parallel to the x-axis? Oh, that's two, and it's in the negative x direction. So there's a negative two. Um, Basil, why I've got you on here, how about the y-coordinate? One. One, right? And so you see how it could be so easy to make, oh, think the y-coordinate was like two, right? Because you are trying to do more than one thing at a time. So minus two, one and then the Z coordinate is two right there, right? And so it's really just a nice, it's really beneficial for us to break these problems down into smaller steps. You might think like, oh, this is going to take more time, but actually it's gonna take less time here. Let's see, for the point C, it's minus two, two, and one, right? Did I get that right? Minus two, two, and one. And then how about point D here? Um, mandolin. So the X is zero. Um, is it? Then, or is X zero? Wait, which one's zero? Oh, wait, no, Y is zero. Y is zero, yep. Y is zero, X is three. Yep. And Z is zero. Correct. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So not only does that help For us. C. Yes. Is it negative two, negative two, negative two, one? Oh, thank you, yes. For... See, I, I, I did the easy one. I should have called on somebody for C also. Um, 
So yeah, minus two in the X, right? That would be this dimension for C. Minus two in the Y and plus one for the Z. Okay, I think I've got it now. Thank you for that correction there. Oh yeah, and I see that was showing up in the chat too. Okay, awesome. So not only is this going to help us with the, just making it easier for us to draw given information, it's also really, it's gonna help us solve the problem. Um, and and I'll, I'll talk about that when we get there. What we're asked to find for this problem here is to find the maximum W so that the tension in any cable, in any segment is less than or equal to 450 pounds. So that is our goal right there. For the solution, anytime we're asked to find for unknown forces, um, a maximum W, anytime we think we might be using equilibrium, let's always start with an FBD. And so where are we going to do our FBD? Are we gonna do it at A, at B, at C, at D? Go ahead and throw it in the chat. What do you all think? It's everybody. Yeah, A, right? Yeah, this is, you know, most of the time, FBDs are pretty obvious. You know, A is A is the place where they all connect. A lot of times in two particle equilibrium, whether 2D or 3D, we're gonna look at the spot where everything is connecting, where all the forces are going on. Now for my FBD for this one, I'm gonna draw point A, and all I'm really gonna do is I'm just gonna say, hey, you know what? I've got a force going up and to the right. I've got another force that's going up and to the left. I've got another force that's coming out of the page, and then I've got this W right here. But we're gonna do this as vectors. So I'm gonna call this W. That really, because it's going in the Z direction, isn't that gonna be a W K hat? And we're looking for that maximum magnitude of that vector so that the tension in any segment is less than 450. This one, let me call this the tension from A to B vector. I'll call this one the tension from A to C, and I'll call this one over here the tension from A to D vector. And so we have those all written as vectors there, but remember, we wanna find magnitudes, and we can express a vector in terms of the magnitude times the unit vector along that line. So the unit vector tells us what direction to go in, right? It says go that way, or it's pointing that way. It's pointing from A to B. It has all the direction information, and AB is the magnitude that's in there. So these are all going to be a magnitude times their unit vector. And so we really, in this FBD, don't think about these as, you know, as like, don't think about TAB as having an unknown X component, an unknown Y and an unknown Z. We know what direction it's going in because we know the coordinates. We just don't know the magnitude, right? And so that's where those vectors are really going to help us out here. And so the, the next thing let's do here is let's look at our vector operations. Let's, let's write out all of our all of our, our vectors here. Like we can see we're gonna need the unit vectors, right? So we can find the unit vector from A to B. Remember, it's the position vector from A to B divided by the magnitude of that position vector. And so here's where those coordinates are really gonna help us out. So instead of having dimension lines up here, and you know, even if you, even if you drew all those dimension lines, like say on the homework, or maybe you copy your picture from mastering onto your homework solutions that you're gonna turn in, I would recommend, you know, first, you know, even before you start solving this or as your first step in solving it, is writing out the coordinates of each point, right? Instead of getting to our unit vector, getting to where we are now and having to figure out the coordinates and the position vector at the same time because now all I have to do to find this position vector is look at the coordinates of B, right? And the coordinates of A. 
And so can I just take B minus A for the X, the Y, and the Z? So it's going to be minus 2 minus 0. 1 minus 0. 2 minus 0. So basically it's a minus 2. It's a 1 and a 2. And then my magnitude is going to be the square root of 2 squared plus 1 squared plus a 2 squared. And so we're going to find the unit vector from A to B is minus 2 thirds I plus a 1 third J and then plus a 2 thirds K hat. Oh, good question. Basil is asking, why did D, C, B vectors go away from A and not towards A? Well, think about this. If we're holding up a weight, and these are all cables, and like, right, we're holding, we're holding up this weight right here, um, right? And I, if I let go of this, what happens, right? It, it falls. And so isn't this, if I, if I cut through that cable right there and I replace it with a, a force, I have to be, it has to be a force going away from it, right? Because it's in tension. So relative to our point A, everything is pulling on point, point A. When we draw an FBD of an object, right? So if we draw an FBD of point A, it's all, all of our forces are going to be relative to that point. So imagine you were point A, wouldn't you feel a force down from W and you had like these ropes attached to you, right? Wouldn't you feel a force pulling towards C? a force pulling towards B and a force pulling towards D. So think about it in terms of everything being relative to the object in our FBD. Good question, thank you. Any other questions so far? Okay, let's do our other ones. The unit vector from A to C would be the the position vector from A to C divided by the magnitude. Again, we do the same process. Um, this one is going to be a minus two thirds I. I'm just going to do it for us. Minus two thirds J and a plus one third K hat. And then our do our one more unit vector here or unit vector from A to D is actually just a plus one i plus a zero in the j oh sorry we don't oh yeah that's we're doing unit vectors yeah plus a zero in the j and then plus a zero in the k direction oh and then so basil did i answer i'm looking at the chat now the dcv vectors are you talking about the unit vectors go away from a not towards a um, let me go back and then Audrey, I'll get to your question. It's like B minus A type of thing. Like, I was thinking that it came from point B going towards A, but I understand what you mean. Okay. And then I think this is also related to the, um, what does the R mean? The R is the position vector. And so a position vector is basically a distance vector, right? If we take the magnitude of the of the vector from A to B is the length of that segment of cable from A to from A to B. And then yes, the other thing I want to point out and Ahmed Ahmed mentioned this was that I, you know, you'll see different nomenclature. You'll see R B over A sometimes in places. I just go A to B. My R A to B means we're going from A and we're going to B. Okay, so I and I can put that over here. So A to B means we're going from A to B. So good questions. Those are really important. We understand those little details. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so now we have all of our, our unit vectors here. The next thing that, that I want to do, and, and this, this can be a little bit redundant, but I like to write out all of my force vectors. 
and and you'll see it actually it's it's going to it's going to make our lives easier so let's go into our our force vectors now so we did our unit vectors but let's write out our our force vectors here and so f a to b is and i, I want to write it out with all the components in there so that's going to be a minus two thirds oh sorry not f a b we call them t's didn't we okay let's call them a t so t a to b is minus two thirds times the magnitude a b in the i it's a and all i'm doing is i'm looking down here i'm looking down here at this at my unit vector to write this up here because remember our t a to b is the magnitude times the unit vector from a to b and so i'm just expressing this out term by term so minus two-thirds was our our i component we have a plus one third is the J component, again, but times the magnitude, the same magnitude, right? TAB magnitude in the I, TAB magnitude in the J. And then I'll also have a positive two thirds of TAB in the K direction. And then I also want to write my TAC vector. And I'm just going to write it right below. And I want, actually, I want to stack my I, J's and K's. And so they're all on top of all on top of each other here. So now I just need to look at my unit vector from A to C. So I'll I'll look at this one down here from A to C right there. And so let's see a minus two thirds of T A C in the I, um, minus two thirds T A C in the J, and a positive one third. TAC in the K direction there. Okay, and then let's do our last one here as well. T from A to D is going to be just a TAD in the I um, plus a zero in the J plus a zero in the K. And let's also go, I'm gonna write the W too, or W vector. So I'm writing all the vectors that are acting on our FBD. And so that's a zero in the I a zero in the J and a minus W in the K direction. The reason I like to do that, and for any type of 3D particle equilibrium problem, is because what I've done now is I've actually, kind of like we did with the coordinates where it helped us with a, a subsequent step, a later step, I now have my sum of forces in the X. I have my sum of forces in the Y and I have the sum of the forces um, in the Z direction as well. So by writing out our vectors, we're, you know, we're just using those vectors to really help us out with solving the problem. At this point, though, however, how many unknowns do we have? How many total unknowns do we have? We have, we, we have three equations, right? I mean, we have, we have four force vectors, but we have three equations, right? We have three equilibrium equations. How many unknowns do we have right now? Do we have three? I see TAB, TAC, TAD, and W. Yeah, we actually have four unknowns right now. This is too many. So what can we do?
And, and actually, before we get to what can we do, I saw a question there. Um, why is k for w minus w? Well, because I wrote my, my vector, right? My w vector is going in the negative z direction. If we go back to the original picture here, right? Right here, I'm going in the, that force is going in the negative z direction. So wouldn't this, if I express that as a vector, wouldn't it be a minus w k? And because it's going, it has a negative z component, just like the other ones have negative and positive x and y components as well. Does that make sense, Ahmed? You can just nod your head. Okay. Um, no, w is the magnitude of the, is w is the weight of the block. Good question. Yes, w is the, is the weight of the block there. Okay, so we have four unknowns, what can we do? Anybody have any ideas? Anybody? So solving, uh, I see solving the y direction first. Uh, we can set w to the parameter weight. Um, well, w is the w is the weight of the crate, right? So in all of the stuff that we've done so far, it is the weight of that crate. Um, solving the y direction first, because y direction, well, y direction has two unknowns, right? I'll have TAB and TAC, so I'll come up with a relationship. Oh, I see, yeah, Luke, set mags of the vectors to 450, right? Because we're looking for... Right, what do we want to find? We want to find the max W, so the tension in any segment is less than or equal to 450. Now, given this geometry, we kind of have random geometry here, right? Like B and C are kind of spread out. Like they're not necessarily at the same slope or anything like that, right? D is off in the other direction. Um, so we need to assume that one of those um, is going to be our, our 450. So we need to assume that one of the segments is at our 450 limit. Now that what we can do and we talked about in 2D, it's the one with the steepest slope. And so and, and the one with the steepest slope in 2D will always have the maximum force in it. So if we had, you know, a system like this in 2D, we could always say, well, whichever one has the maximum slope is going to be the maximum tension. In 3D, that's not always the case, but it's, a, it's an okay assumption for us to start with. So which one of these, TAB, TAC, or TAD, has the maximum slope in the same direction as our weight. So our weight is applied in the k direction. Which one of these is steepest in that? Isn't it TAB? Yeah, so TAB. So let's assume that TAB has the magnitude of 450 pounds and um, we're gonna need to check that assumption. And the reason we're checking that or we're assuming that is because um, it has the steepest slope in the z direction and w it's a w is equal to a minus wk so our load is in the k direction So now if we have TAB, now I think I really like, um, who was it, Leah's. Leah said, let's sum forces in the Y. And actually, yeah, I'm not going to necessarily go in order all the time. Let's go ahead and let's do some of the forces in the Y right away. And that's the other advantage of writing out all the vectors because it may not, I may not start with sum of forces in the X. I may start with sum of forces in the Z. In this case, we're going to start with sum of forces in the Y. My my positive is based off of my vectors. So I don't, I'm not gonna write my coordinate system here. 
It's just based off of my vectors there. So I have a plus one third times um, TAB, which we said we're gonna set equal to 450 pounds, and then a minus two thirds times TAC is gonna be equal to zero. I can solve this TAC. We're gonna find here is equal to 225 pounds. And so our assumption, okay. Assumption is okay so far, right? Because that's less than 450, less than or equal to 450 pounds. Now that we have TAC and TAB, now we can we can look back at our vectors over here, and we can say, oh, should we do sum of forces in the x, or should we do sum of forces in the z? It looks like both of them are only going to have one unknown. The other thing I want to point out is we started with three equations and three unknowns, right? Once we assumed TAB was equal to 450. But I am always looking to make my life easier. And so I'm looking for one equation with one unknown. I go through all of them. If I can't find that, the next, next, next best thing is two equations, two unknowns. If I can't do that, then the next best thing is three equations, three unknowns. Okay, but I'm always looking to make my life easier. So I'm never going to just like start writing equations out I'm always gonna look and say, do any of these just have one unknown? Because you can see how easy that algebra was, right? For that summing forces in the Y. Well, let's go to, um, why don't we solve for W? When, let's go to sum of forces in the Z is equal to zero. We're gonna have a two thirds times TAB, which is the 450, a plus one third times TAC, which is 225, and a, um minus w is equal to zero and so i mean there's why i put the negative w on there right because is it shouldn't w when i sum force in the z be going down relative to my fbd it's a downward force isn't it so it's a negative w because then i can just pull out you know in vector format it's correct to write it as a negative w but then it also i don't have to worry about the sign when i get to my summing forces equations my equilibrium equations I can solve this now. I'm gonna find that W is equal to 375 pounds, which is still less than 450. So we're okay. Our assumption is okay there. How is W only 375 pounds? I said like 400, we can hold 450 pounds. Our, our rope can hold 450 pounds, but we only have 375 pounds going going down. Our, or the maximum weight we can hold is only 375 pounds. It's because it is actually more efficient. If I want to hold, like if this, like if this water bottle was the at the breaking strength of my rope, I could hold like, you know, if this was 450 pounds, I could hold 450 pounds like this with just the one strap. As soon as I start trying to hold a vertical force with horizontal cables, I have to exert a lot more force. Like I'm exerting compared to this, and even here I'm exerting more force. Or like if I try to, and is it even possible for me to get this totally horizontal? I mean, I'm, I'm pulling as hard as I can. There's still a little slope in there, isn't there? And so it's just, it's an, it's really, it's, it's just, all it is is it's just structurally inefficient, but maybe it's because there's no ceiling above us. Maybe we're in a stadium, a football stadium, and they have those sky cams that, you know, that hover around over the football stadium when there's nothing above them because all they can attach to are the walls on the sides. And so they have to, you know, they can, they're going to be holding less weight than actually the cables are made for. We still do need to do our, our one last equation. Let's go sum of force in the x is equal to zero. And this is going to include, if we look at that there, um, what is that? That's a, um, I, I lost my, it's a minus two thirds AB minus two thirds AC. So minus two thirds of 450 minus two thirds of, the 225 
and then a positive tension from A to D is equal to zero. It actually just so happens that in this one, A to D is 450 pounds, which is equal to the limit, but okay. So we said it had to be less than or equal to, but it's okay. Now the reason that this one is so high um, is based on the other plane of equilibriums that are engaged in three dimensions. In 2D, we only have one plane, right? We're in the XY plane. But in this one, we have to think about how there's A, A B, and AC are going in the opposite direction of AD. So if I go back to that original picture here, right, we see A, we see A, B is going in the negative X in general. AC is going in the negative X, but AD is going in the positive X. And so in order to meet equilibrium in the X direction, which is what we just did, then this has to be really big. TAD ends up being the, the same at that limit right there, of uh, that, that really large value there. So it's at the limit, but okay. So we found our answer. So W max is equal to 375 pounds. That's what we can hold in that system um, right there. Now, what would we do if I found TAD was like 550? Say we found it to be equal to 550. Wouldn't we have to go back? Right, reassign. I would go back and we would set, you know, so recalculate and we would set TAD equal to 450 and start again. Now, it's really, you might think, oh man, that's a lot of work. Actually, we only have to go back to here. We all, right? These vectors aren't going to change at all, are they? Nothing with the vector stuff is going to change. So the only thing we would have to do is do the sum of the force in the y, the z, and the x again, and and we'd be and we'd be done, right? So it's not a big deal because all the work we did up front was really setting us up to, regardless of whether our assumption was okay or not, it was still going to work. Right, and since, and yeah, call of, yeah, since TAD would still be, um, so if we found, if we, whatever one we find to violate our assumption, that's the one, we know that one's the biggest one, uh, relatively the biggest one, and so it's still going to be relatively the biggest one, even if we go back and set TAD, um, even if we set a new value and recalculate. Okay, sorry I went over uh, a minute again there. You all have a